Where have we been recently? Well, we've been for over a year now with some interruptions and breaks. We have been in the Gospel of John. We've called it Life, the Joy and Journey of Knowing Christ. We've called it that because John has said, uh, I write these things that your joy may be full. He said, and this is life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And he has said, all these things are written, these signs are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. It's a wonderful book. It's a gospel. It's the journalism of a man who referred to himself as the one, the apostle whom Jesus loved, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Well, just five more messages from this series in the amazing Gospel of John, and I will skip over a little material. We haven't really skipped over anything much in John, but I'm going to skip over some of the stuff about Peter. I preached about all of that back in 2020, and I urge you, if you're wanting to study those passages, to uh, look up my messages uh, under the Polished Stone series on YouTube uh, back in 2020. But let me ask you this as we get started this morning. Have you ever heard of David Rush? Anyone ever heard of David Rush? Anyone? Anyone? Well, apparently he holds more Guinness Book of World Records, records <laughs> than anyone else. Uh, I mean, he's the world's fastest juggler. He's the world's slowest juggler. He, he, he's the one who's juggled the most bowling balls. Now, I can't even imagine that, but yes, he has. He's one of those guys, you'll remember this part, he went on America's uh, Got Talent, and he, he balances all those huge things on his chin. Uh, that guy's had to have had a chin implant. I, I mean, I just think there's got to be some steel there or some kind of bracket. I mean, he's got, he holds the Guinness Book of World Records. He holds the record for having stacked successfully the most bars of wet soap. Can you imagine that? I didn't check to see if anyone else is even close or... or closing in on any of his records. I, I don't know. But, you know, in the chase to try and catch David Rush and surpass his number of records, I'm sure there are some aspiring people. But there's one record neither Rush nor anyone else will ever hold or ever break. And that is that there is one man so unique, so innocent, so wronged, so crushed under divine wrath and human injustice that no one will ever surpass his record. Of course, his name is Jesus. No one can ever be higher than Jesus, but watch this. No one can ever be lower than Jesus got, as we're going to read, as he submitted himself to Pilate? and to ultimately the death of the cross. No one so hated, no one so worshipped, no one can be more falsely accused than Christ. You say, oh, there's no, I know someone who was really accused, but they're guilty of something, amen? They may not be guilty of what they're accused of, but they're guilty of something. Jesus is the Lamb of God, tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Though there's no one that's ever been more accurately accused. You make yourself to be the Son of God. We're going to read that. They accused him of making himself equal with God. Guilty as charged. Jesus made it very clear that he believed himself to be God in the flesh. He couldn't balance or carry his own cross. He doesn't hold the record for the most piercings, but he does hold the record for the most meaningful and necessary piercings. Amen? The record you might not think of, though, is the most ironies in a trial. 
the most ironies in a trial. We're going to see some of those things today, some of those ironies today. One of the most amazing records Jesus will always hold is the most power, watch this, the most power under complete control. Did you know that's what meekness is? Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is power under control. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall, what? Inherit the earth. Psalm 2, 8, prophesied of the Lord Jesus, ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Jesus held all of his power under absolute control and submission to the Father. And it was unlimited power. Ironically, Jesus in this text is standing before a big fish in a little pond. Here's what I mean by that. His name is Pilate, and he's just asked what is truth, but he's just a regional politician, and he's in authority seemingly over the Lord Jesus Christ. Read with me John chapter 19. Let's read the first four verses. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Some manuscripts manuscripts read there uh, that they continually came before him to do this. And so, and so the, but that's the idea that they're in harmony. It's just that they kept mocking him, striking him. Pilate, verse 4, then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. The title of the message this morning is Truth on Trial. Truth on Trial. I'm going to give you all three points. We're not going to go point one, point two, point three. Uh, We're just going to do them all at the same time uh, because it's all mixed in. And so this will be a little different than what I normally do. I want you to see the indecisive represented here. Many indecisive people today about Jesus, right? I want you to see the irreverent. There are so many in our day that are irreverent towards the Lord Jesus. And I want you to see the intolerable. In other words, they they hate God. They hate Jesus Christ. And so our indecisive is seen in the the man Pilate. He's an indecisive regional politician. And he's asked Jesus what is truth. He said, I find no fault in him. And he's He's constantly bringing him out. The irreverent are the Roman soldiers. We've read here, they've mocked him. They've said, hail, king of the Jews. They're going to end up hitting him and and continuing to mock him. And then those that scream out, crucify him, crucify him. Those are the intolerable, the intolerable religious mob. And there are people today that hate the true God, and yet they're very, very religious people. Now, let's talk first about the indecisive and then just sort of weave all these through our narrative here. This indecisive regional politician. We sort of want to appreciate Pilate, don't we? I mean, we're sort of tempted. He's trying. I mean, he's trying. He's trying not to crucify Jesus. He's trying, though, something more. He's trying harder to appease people and keep himself safe in his rule, in his appointment as a regional politician. Appeasement is his M.O., his modus operandi. However, uh, Matthew and Mark mention, they mention Pilate scourging or having Jesus scourged, but not in the chronological way. They just make mention of it. It's not contradictory to what John says, but it just mentions that John, like Luke, presents it chronologically. Luke never actually mentions it, but he says, I will therefore chastise him and release him. That he quotes Pilate. Well, the chastisement was this scourging that's going to come out. Uh, Look at verse 5. 
Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. See, he had had, him, had Jesus scourged, and that did not appease them. Let's not just blink at the scourge, though. I mean, this is not a slap on the wrist. Uh, one scholar said this would make pulp out of the back of a man. This was probably done with what's called a cat of nine tails. It was several lashes of uh, strips of leather, and on the ends of these ribbons were tied pieces of glass or bone or, or wood and stuff that would rip the flesh off of a man. And before we think too highly of Pilate, remember he's having the son of the living God whipped. These irreverent soldiers are mocking Jesus. And look what, look what happens. They said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. And we know from the other Gospels they would say, Who hit you? If you're the Son of God, tell us who hit you. Jesus not only knew who hit him, the irony is Jesus had always known who would hit him. And these soldiers, with probably all of their muscles and their armor and their weapons and this, the, the great power of Rome behind them, mistreating our Lord Jesus. The irony is that that same Jesus ordered an angel to, who killed 185,000 Assyrians like that in the Old Testament. This same God helped a young shepherd boy, delivered Goliath into his hand, and had guided the stone from a simple sling to take down a giant who was over nine feet tall. This same God drowned an entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea, the irony of it all. Back at verse 4, look at it. Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Another irony. I, I'm, the one, I, I'm the one that's going to decide whether this man deserves to live or die. Pilate thinks he will convince them and that this scourging, this chastisement, this discipline would appease them and he says in verse 5 behold the man now he's not speaking theologically and yet I think John is referencing that even the Spirit of God can even speak through a pagan regional politician because in fact Jesus is the man he is the son of man his favorite reference to himself was son of of man. He is the second representative man or the second Adam. Paul tells us in Romans 5 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Look down at verses 6 through 9. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went out again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Isn't it interesting that Pilate's got more faith in Jesus than these these Pharisees do. Now, he doesn't have saving faith, but at least, he's at least superstitious, isn't he? Ooh, I, I might want to make sure I'm not about to um, hurt someone who's holy and has power. Of course, he, he, he couldn't figure it out. He wouldn't accept the truth. Pilate is uh, challenging them with his authority. He's saying, not that you, he's not saying you literally go crucify him, I think. He's saying, look, you think you, you're, in you're telling me what to do. Why don't you do it? He knew they didn't have the authority, <coughs> excuse me, under Roman rule to do that. Matthew 27, 19 tells us that Pilate uh, 
had heard the voice of wisdom through his wife saying, have nothing to do with this man. I think that's in his mind as he does this. And then you have the, for emphasis, the I and the we. I find no fault in him, verse 6, the last phrase. But then verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law. The we is emphasized. They're saying, look, we, we have a law that's from God. Now let me tell you what law they're talking about. They're talking about Leviticus chapter 24, verses 14, 15, and 16. Someone had cursed God, and this uh, woman's son, who was, uh, she was an Israelite, but her son cursed God. And the Bible says, take outside the camp him who has cursed, then let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Here's another irony. They're saying that Jesus is the blasphemer, and they're the one cursing him. Crucify him! Crucify him! And Jesus was never cursing God. They're equating him claiming to be God as blaspheming God, and yet he is literally God in the flesh. And then in verse 10, Pilate confesses something that he is facing. He must decide. Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Verse 11, Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivers me to you has the greater sin. Speaking of Caiaphas, he's going to be held even more accountable. By the way, an interesting verse, if sin is sin is sin is sin, and all sin is the same, and, and, and we just need to say that, uh, you know, we don't need to get worked up, too worked up about certain sins. I don't know what that verse means then. Sin is sin in the fact that it's all sin, but there is greater sin and there is lesser sin. And Jesus said there is a weightier matter of the law. Just something to challenge the common evangelical uh, view there that seems to be out there so often. Pilate is indecisive. Here we see a man, church, he can't escape having to decide about Jesus. I tell you, you'll never escape having to decide about Jesus. If you reject Jesus as the truth, you can't just dismiss him. He will not just be dismissed to someone else. You, you personally will need to decide about Jesus. And as we said last week, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord and God, Lord and God. He's a liar, as C.S. Lewis said. He knew his claims were false, and he purposely misled the masses of people and frauded this religion we call Christianity. Or he's a lunatic. He sincerely believed that he was God, but he was absolutely, as C.S. Lewis said, like a poached egg. He was just an egghead. He was just dumb. He was crazy. Or he is in fact Lord. And God. He's left nothing else open to us. Verse 14, or verses 13 and 14. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Another irony. Behold the man, Pilate, you are speaking absolute correct theology. Jesus is the man. He's the second Adam. He is the son of man, which is a title for deity, yet you don't know it. And they don't know it, Pilate, but in fact, he is their king. He is king of kings, and he is lord of lords. And you are speaking the truth. What an irony. And they, here's another irony. They are wanting to hurry this up because they've got religious duties to do. The Passover. And then here's even another layer of irony. The Bible says, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, Jesus Christ is our Passover. The very festival, uh, the very 
meal that they're going to observe is picturesque of the fact that God will pass over our sins when he sees the blood, not the blood of an animal on the doorposts of a building, but the blood of his own dear son across our dirty soul. I'm telling you folks, this is layered with irony here. This is an indecisive regional politician, irreverent Roman soldiers. And then, of course, as we're going to see, this is very much a hateful, hateful, intolerable mob of religious people. Don't think because you're religious that, oh, I'm okay. I'm going to tell you, Jesus' harshest words were for religious people. Behold your king. This was late morning probably on Good Friday. He's going to the cross. He's about to be led away, verse 16, to be crucified. And I want you to think about some things as we read the rest. Let's just read the rest of it. And believe it or not, we're going to move to some application and close. But they cried out. Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. They hated Caesar. They hated Roman rule. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. An intolerable mob. Irreverent soldiers and an indecisive politician you may have been indecisive yourself about jesus but you need to know today you cannot defer your decision inevitably joshua said to the children of israel who were needing to go across the jordan they were needing to go into god's blessing what a picture God's got a blessing for you, salvation. God, Jesus, has become the bridge that crosses the river. <laughs> but choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you choose Christ or will you try to delay and be indecisive? The Bible says this about someone who won't decide about Jesus. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's John 3, 36 in this very gospel. John records our Lord as saying, to not decide is to decide, and to not decide is to remain under the wrath of God. Let me tell you, if you've not decided about Jesus today, you're in a very dangerous place. A very dangerous place. Listen, uh, these people here, the Romans, the Jews, they're selfishly ambitious. They care about their own power, both the religious Jews... Caiaphas, their power structure that had ceased long ago being uh, an incorrupt religion. It had become a corrupted religion. It's not the faith of the Old Testament. Don't be confused about that. And they don't obey Jesus right there. Pilate had asked, what is truth? Jesus, the one that said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. He had walked among them. They had seen his miracles. They'd marveled at his teaching. They had been convicted and convinced, but they wouldn't submit. Not only are there the indecisive, but there are those who just hate the authority of God. And the Bible says in Romans 2, 8, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, the judgment of God. Don't fail to decide about Jesus. You may say, well, I, 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 I think a lot of Jesus. You may even reverence Jesus as a good person. But in fact, it's as if you don't reverence him at all. Unless you receive what someone says. You know, if I come in here and I say, I, 
I want you all to know that uh, I've, uh, I, I've, got, I've got someone coming next week, and uh, they're going to they're gonna give every one of you $500. And you say, well, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I don't believe that. And I keep trying to convince you. And, you, and then someone says, do you have a good pastor? Oh, yeah, we have a good pastor. And, 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 and they keep asking you questions. So do he encur- does he encourage you? Oh, yes, he encourages you. And then I walk up and you're talking to, and they say, does he always tell you the truth? Well, oh, yes, he, well, you, you've dishonored me. You, you, you don't believe what I'm, I'm saying. And, and, and so there are a lot of people who think, well, I, I don't hate Jesus. I, I'm not irreverent. And yet you've not received his words that are spirit and life. You've not bowed the knee. You've not made him Lord. You may not think much of Jesus. You may not reverence him as king, but eventually everyone will. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him, John 12, 48 says. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Jesus may not be your Lord now, but you know eventually Jesus will be Lord of everyone. Did you know they may not be in heaven, but the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, God has given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things above the earth, on the earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Unlike the above, people we mentioned who say they don't hate Jesus, you may actually hate Jesus. I don't know why you're in a Baptist church today, but maybe just you're keeping some sort of facade up. I don't know. The irony is is that he loves you. A lot of people don't, they don't like hell. I don't know anyone that likes hell. But I mean, there are people that just say, I'm just not going to, I'm going to believe the rest of the Bible, but I'm not going to believe in hell. This makes no sense what I'm reading then. Absolutely no sense. Well, see, so I'm just more inclusive. If someone follows another religion and they're sincere, they're, they're going to be in, in heaven. Well, are you more inclusive? You just excluded most of the world. Think about it. Most people are not religious dot every I, cross every T. You know, they're not a Mother Teresa. They're, they're, not, a, they're not a Billy Graham. They're, they're, not, they're not one of these, these type people who give their whole life to religion. You've just been more exclusive than I am. Let me show you. I believe Jesus is exclusive to salvation, don't get me wrong. He's the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. But I'm more inclusive than you because my gospel says this, no matter who you are, what sin you've committed, what color you are, how much money you have, where you live, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's more inclusive, amen? You say, well, I still don't like hell. But love equals sacrifice. What is love without sacrifice? And if there is no hell, what did God sacrifice? You say, well, Jesus set a good example going to the cross. Well, he set a good example. Are you going to die on a cross? It was, he was not merely an example. He was our substitute. Your loving God sacrificed for you. And I want to tell you, as bad as this is in chapter 19... As bad as what we're going to read next uh, two Sundays from now is, is, as bad as the nails are and the crown of thorns and the, the cross and all of this, I'm going to tell you it was but a pinprick compared to the anguish of soul Jesus experienced when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, that is hell, separation from God. So I just don't, it's just so archaic to think about the fires of hell. Well, I believe in the literal fire of hell, but I think it's much more than that. In fact, C.S. Lewis tells the story of a busload of people from hell that take a trip, they get a day to take a field trip to heaven. It's in his The Great Divorce. 
and none of them choose heaven. They all choose to go back to hell. They all choose eternity separated from God. And here's why. And perhaps this is right. You see, it's, it's very clear that part of, of the penalty of sin is enslavement to sin. Jesus said that in John's gospel. He who sins continues to sin as a slave to sin. Paul taught it in Romans. Paul taught it in Galatians. Sin enslaves you. And so watch this. If Jesus is not your Lord and your Messiah, your King, your Savior, then there's something else that motivates you. There's something else that you worship. There's something else that you love. There's something else to which you are devoted. Now, if you're devoted to Jesus, the Spirit of God is to control you. Jesus is looking out for you. You're supposed to do what he says. In fact, you're a slave to him. Paul called himself a doulos, a slave, a bond slave, or a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And so you're, you're not really free, and yet you're freer than you could ever be because we stand in the liberty that Jesus Christ has given us. He has released us from our former taskmasters that were cruel masters. They are the addictions and the bondage and the chains of sin. But if you don't have Jesus, your deliverer, if you don't have a substitute for sin, if you don't have one that's absorbed the wrath of God and experienced what hell truly is, separation from God on the cross, then you are still enslaved by those sins. And whatever they may be, they begin to become totally dominant in your life. And not to pick on one sin, but the easiest example is substance abuse. And you think of the person that loves that substance, enjoys that substance, whether it be alcohol or other forms of drugs and they love it, and as my pastor used to say, the man takes the drink, the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. And all of a sudden, there's a bondage, and there's hatred, but you can't escape. The claws are in you, and you're, you, there, there's no way to overcome. You have what you wanted, but really what you wanted has you. Is that a better master? Is that more freedom? And the thing C.S. Lewis says is, is that the epitome of hell is that it is a monument to human freedom. People go to hell because they've chosen to go to hell, and they've chosen to go to hell because they've rejected Jesus, or they've at the very least been indecisive and rejected him implicitly. C.S. Lewis goes on to say that he believes hell will be the constant the constant repetition of your worst moments. In other words, if you're a complainer, a lost complainer, if you're a saved complainer, quit being backslidden and get filled with the Holy Spirit and quit complaining, amen? But if you're lost, just think of, of, if you're just totally complaining all the time, all the time, if you're addicted, that, that need all the time, just over and over and over and over again, and according to Becky Piper in her book, Hope Has Its Reasons, human love here offers a true analogy. The more a father loves his son, the more he hates in him the drunkard, the liar, the traitor. Those are destroying him. In other words, you can't have love without wrath. I mean, t someone takes your grandson. Someone takes your wife. They start doing something to her. You say, well, I'm just supposed to love. No. You're going to be wrathful toward that person because of your great love for your loved one. And God sees us and loves us in spite of us. But he hates our sin. So he sent Jesus to stand before this petty politician to be mistreated by these irreverent soldiers and to be rejected by the religious establishment of his day so that he could deliver us from all those things that solicit our devotion, our love, our attention, our resources and money, but then they come and enslave us. That is a God of love that says, I want to deliver my people from sin. Would you receive this God of love today? Oh, I pray that you would receive 
the Lord Jesus Christ today.